uh, educator, school leader, it's folks who are reporting escalating behavior from kids, classrooms out of control, completely depleted and exhausted educators, school leaders at their wits end, uh, kids with no history of behavioral challenges, exhibiting extreme behaviors. Uh, it is rough out there. So we wanted to bring together some of our team members at Think Kids, some of our advisory council members, and uh, some of our fellow, our colleagues, educators, and school leaders to talk about these challenges and what, uh, how we understand them right now, and as a result, what we could do to help. Uh, so I want to quickly just give a, uh, our panelists a chance to do a really quick round of introductions. Um, Hallie, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Hallie Carpenter, and I'm a clinical trainer and consultant on the staff at Think Kids. And um, I'm excited to be here because education is close to my heart as I've worked um, for 15 years in education settings as a school psychologist and um, currently have the um, pleasure and opportunity to work with schools on how to implement collaborative problem solving into their um, school day and their school building. So I'm happy to be here with all of you today. Thanks, Hallie. Jordan. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Spikes. And um, like Hallie, I'm a, I'm a consultant and trainer at Think Kids. And I, too, have the fortune of being able to work closely with a lot of schools and folks in schools who are working with students who present with challenging behavior and teaching and informing them of this model and then working side by side with them to try and get it to work. And um, I look forward to kind of in learning from everyone here and also just engaging with all of you and your questions. Thanks, Jordan. Tia, how about you, please? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tia Lights. I am the principal of the Helen Y. Davis Leadership Academy in Dorchester. I'm also a practicum professor and lecturer at UMass Boston and a Think Kids uh, council member. Um, every single day, I'm just immersed with the love of my students and family. So I'm just grateful to be here to um, unpack what's going on and um, coming up with solutions. Thank you, Tia. Um, Sharon. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharon Lazinki. I'm the executive director at Boston Prep Charter Public School, which is a middle and high school um, on the Hyde Park Mattapan line. Um, and it's great to be with folks. Uh, Stuart, Jordan and Hallie have all worked with our community um, teaching us about collaborative problem solving. So excited for the conversation. And by the way, folks, uh, if you don't recognize these towns, Dorchester, Hyde Park, et cetera, uh, these are places right around uh, the Boston area, which we call home, but don't worry. Um, these conversations, sadly, are gonna be just as relevant to our friends in Oregon, in Canada, um, and right here in Boston as well. Shalia, please. Hi, I'm Shalia Tresilis. Um, I work at the Ellison Park School in Mattapan. I am a K-2 sheltered English immersion um, educator. I am a career changer, so I've been in education about 11 years, and I look forward to sharing with you all and talking with you all today. Great. Thank you, folks. Um, and I want to thank everybody who um, sent in uh, some questions and comments ahead of time, and I want to let you know that um, those of you who did and shared what's going on for you, you are um, not alone. Uh, many of you submitted very, very similar concerns, and they're very similar to the kinds of things that I was describing before that we've been hearing from people um, all over. Uh, you know, we've been hearing all kinds of challenging behaviors from kids um, unable to sit in a classroom, uh, lack of stamina to get through the day, kids uh, looking totally, uh, showing uh, sort of incredible amounts of boredom, disengagement, disinterest, lack of what apparently looks like lack of motivation, uh, all the way to kids um, running from school, uh, we call the, the runners or the bolters, to kids with a great deal of anxiety, uh, school refusal, um, kids uh, arriving late, huge gaps in learning, um, all kinds of things. So from the sort of mild to the moderate, from the internalizing to the externalizing, whether it's hitting aggression, fighting, bullying, quickness to anger, uh, or disengagement, uh, we're, we're seeing um, tons of it throughout the schools um, from the earliest of grades up um, through high school as well. I know here in Boston, we woke up again to another story today of a horrific incident of violence in our local schools. And we've um, ha had them, it seems like almost every 
day at this point. Uh, and the impact, of course, on everyone um, is tremendous, uh, as if uh, teachers weren't burned out and fatigued um, before. Uh, there's a cascade effect uh, with other students as well. Uh, and everybody's asking, what do we do? How can we work together on this? So that's the purpose of this webinar. Um, and I'd like to start by just asking um, our colleagues who are, um, as they like to say, in the front lines of education uh, to tell us you know, what you are seeing um, in your own words. And Sharon, you and I spoke about this the other day. If you wouldn't mind kicking it off with um, what you've been seeing as a school leader, um, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure like my fellow school leaders um, and teachers here, we're seeing probably a lot of the same things. Um, and, and Stuart, you gave a great list uh, just a few seconds ago. I think, you know, as a school, we are seeing um, students more time wandering in the hallways while classes are happening, sort of an, an avoidance of, of work and an accumulated number of minutes. Um, we're seeing challenges with students um, sitting um, in their seats and responding to, you know, a redirection or a reminder. Um, we are, um, you know, seeing things that we would have in the past been like, you know, oh, you know, hey, uh, you're not in school dress code. Do you mind taking off that sweatshirt? And, and typically like, sure, I'll take it off and a refusal to do that and a, and a sort of um, and sometimes that's met with a response, right? A, a verbal response. Um, and then we're seeing things that are more challenging um, and we would say like an increase in derogatory language directed between students um, and between students and teachers. And that has been um, racist and homophobic and misogynistic. Um, and we have seen, um, uh, incidents of students um, getting upset and that leading to physical altercations um, on campus, outside, kind of at the at the nearby parks. Um, and and for us, it's been generally you know two students who um, maybe had issues someplace else and it spills over. Um, but things get can get uh, loud quickly, um, and it seems that we're all struggling to regulate. Um, and one of the other things that we've seen is just, uh, you know, always coming in from lunch has been challenging, right? Sometimes schedule changes have been challenging, but um, for more kids, that ability to regulate through transitions um, has certainly um, increased. So those are some of the things that, that we're seeing um, every day. Thank you, Sharon. One of the things that you're describing right off the top here is um, you know, you've got a lot of dysregulated kids and nothing like dysregulated kids to cause dysregulated adults as well. And um, then you're sort of uh, off to the races. Um, Shalia, love to hear um, your perspective on what you've been seeing. Um, sure. My kids are five and six years old, so there are some of our earliest learners. Um, and what I'm noticing with them is lots of them um, came straight from home daycare, like they haven't been in school at all, or they did some remote learning online, um, and they really haven't had a school experience. So those um, social emotional skills, those foundational pieces that you find in K0 and K1, um, in essence, have been skipped over. So they're now sitting in a classroom where sitting on the rug for too long. Um, they frequent bathroom trips or washing their hands or um, getting frustrated easier. Um, lots more um, crying um, accidents with clothes, like, you know, wetting themselves or using the bathrooms on themselves when they're potty trained. Um, it means being at lunch and having to help a colleague who has a five-year-old who may be kicking and screaming on the floor in the lunchroom or hitting their, you know, hitting their friends and peers, um, really less self-regulation skills, um, definitely more frustrated and they get to the top faster, right? Like there's, you know, it's like from zero to 100 versus like maybe creeping from zero to 20 to 40. It's kind of like zero and we are at a hundred friends and we need every, you know, all hands on deck to try to figure it out. So that's what I can say for at least K K two five year old six year old. Well, yeah, you know, I was going to say, Shalia, thank you for the description of what this looks like in the younger grades, because the challenging behavior looks different than it perhaps does at Boston Prep, Sharon, uh, you know, in the high school. Uh, and yet, I imagine, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, the drivers of it are the same, even though it looks different at uh, different developmental points. 
Tia, how about you? Anything that you would add to what you're seeing, which you're probably you, you would say all of the above um, and? So um, as I'm thinking about my scholars, you know, grade six, seventh and eighth, middle school age, 11 to 14, I think a lot of their frustration is coming from the COVID learning loss and feeling like I miss something I don't understand and how can I articulate that in the classroom while keeping in a regulated state. Um, that can bring a lot of anguish you know, to my, my students' minds and it can bring anguish to the teacher as well. I also think there's like a huge culture shift in schools where things that we had built upon camaraderie before, it kind of got dismantled um, throughout last year and the rebuild is taking a slow start. And so that is also um, causing school communities, my community of frustration and the timeliness of rebuilding those uh, cultural aspects. Also, I'm finding that students aren't feeling like they are the priority stakeholder within their own education because we were in a virtual world where everything is being dictated to them with directions like this and you have to do it this way in a, in a total shift. When before, you know, K through what the grades that they came to me in sixth grade, sixth, seventh and eighth grade, they did feel passionate about their work. They felt passionate about being stakeholders in their education. And now some of that is crumbling and that takes a direct effect on families and communication um, when it comes down to it because the parents see their student frustrated and it, re it just comes with a conundrum of frustration. So just building um, culture and being a stakeholder from all angles, you know, and really acknowledging that students are the primary stakeholders in their own journey and how do we re rebuild that. That's a really important observation. Um, and I know school culture is a major focus of, of yours, uh, both in your own school, but also your research. So when we get to the, okay, so uh, what do we do about this um, in a little bit, I think we, we're gonna need to make sure to focus on that aspect as well. So it sounds like there's you know, uh, a fair degree of, um, agreement across schools in your cases uh, across grades we're seeing the same kind of very dysregulated behavior and kids having a hard time adhering to expectations um, what i want to talk a little bit about again before we get to um, solutions is what's causing this all and uh, i'll just set a little context here for folks who are uh, new to our work at think kids we work hard to um, promote the idea that kids who struggle with their behavior, struggle to manage their behavior, that they don't lack the will to behave well. What they lack are the skills to behave well. Some of the very types of skills that you all have been mentioning that have to do with um, self-regulation, emotion regulation, social thinking skills, flexibility, frustration tolerance, and general problem solving skills. Uh, so, you know, what we're known for is helping kids um, who struggle with the skills necessary to handle their challenging behavior. And what I've always uh, said about challenging behavior is I think that it happens in the gap between expectations placed upon someone and the skills they have to handle those expectations. And if somebody has the skills to handle those expectations, life is good. Um, however, for many reasons, kids can struggle with skills relative to their peers that make it hard for them to meet those expectations or sometimes our expectations are a little unreasonable, even if kids' skills are fairly typical. But wherever that gap exists, that's where we see challenging behavior. And in my view, the pandemic has caused the perfect storm here because in essence, kids are coming back into school one year later and every good school, every year, the expectation should go up, which should stretch the kid to meet the skills, right? So the expectations have continued to climb. And by the way, the expectations outside of school for flexibility, frustration, tolerance, problem solving, continued to climb. And unfortunately, I think at that same time, kids have not progressed developmentally. The reality is that hybrid remote um, school did not affect the same progress developmentally. And for many kids and families, sadly, the trauma, the chronic stress and trauma and loss that they experience, what do we know about those things? Chronic toxic stress and trauma gets in the way of skill development. So we have expectations going up and skills going down. So kids who actually were doing okay all of a sudden now have a gap. Kids who had a gap to begin with, that gap has gotten even bigger. And that's sort of the, the frame that I like to put on trying to understand this. But I'd like to ask uh, all of our panelists to, to chime in here uh, um, and, and try to help us understand more about what's going on here. 
Um, Hallie, uh, let me let me see if you uh, could chime in here with some uh, some thoughts about what's causing this perfect storm. Yeah, Stuart, I was kind of um, wanted to build on that idea of skills that you were just talking about um, and kind of make a, a few couple points about that. Um, one, that not only does stress impact our ability to, you know, build those skills and for our students to build those skills, but it also impacts their ability to access those skills. And so having been in a situation where we're living in a pandemic and there are stressors, extra stressors on families, right, and we know that those stressors um, impact kids, extra stressors on teachers, knowing that there's those expectations that they have of themselves to hold their kids to a high level, um, creates a place where it's hard for anybody to be able to access skills, um, those types of skills that you're talking about, problem solving, emotion regulation, um, attention and working memory, some of those types of things where we might look pretty good in other situations, but under this amount of stress, it makes it harder for kids to be able to access those as well as adults, right? To be able to think clearly through situations. Another point that I was thinking about as well is when we think about that remote learning um, experience that kids have, what was missing from that? And, and I would say this is something that probably everybody would touch on as, as something that has that was really challenging about that is that I think we don't realize how many opportunities throughout the day when kids are in a school building and they're interfacing with other kids and the adults are interfacing with them, that those are opportunities for small doses of this type of social emotional skill building that we talk about, right? It sounds so simple <laughs> on the surface, like, like, right? We just, we have a conversation with a kid or this kid has an interaction with another kid and they have to work through a problem. But those are those opportunities to, to further develop those skills and those were missing in that remote kind of hybrid um, world. And so that can make things challenging coming back. To yeah, the Hallie, that's such an important observation because you know, like any skill, like if you don't practice it, it goes away on you. You know, I, I used to travel around doing all this public speaking. The first time I traveled after the pandemic, it was, I was like, how do you do this? Like, I, I don't even sort of remember exactly how to do this, even though I could do it in my sleep before just because of repetition. And of course, if you're trying to build new skills, you know, keep in mind, whenever any of us use the term sort of build skills, we're literally talking about changing the brain. And to change the brain, it's all about repetition and practice. And to your point, there's been like no practice um, for quite some time. Yeah. Shelly, I'd love to hear you uh, chime in here if you have some thoughts as well as to the why is this happening? Um, I'm going to go back to the skills because just because they weren't in school and, you know, like fully they were, you know, remote hybrid um, didn't change the expectation that when they came into school, the beginning of this year, we still had to administer beginning of the year assessments. So we're assessing these children um, who may have been lagging before, who are even more lagging now. And the expectation is that we assess them and we monitor that progress. We monitor where they are and what they're, you know, what they're displaying to us not considering that they've been hybrid, they've been remote. So they are really truly missing some of these skills that we're looking at. So they start off in a deficit and behind like looking at them on paper and it continues to progress during the year because you know we don't jump right in. Like we're teaching kids letters and sounds who may have, you know, in regular times come in already having that information. So none of those requirements changed at a district or state level. We're still testing and assessing and that is, that's stressful. Yeah, so, so one of the things you're pointing to again is it's not just about skills, it's also about the expectations, right? And so, you know, I think part of what I feel us heading in the direction of here is when we're gonna talk about the what to do is if those are two primary levers, expectations and skills, something's gotta give um, when it comes to, to, you know, those are the two things we can work on. And by the way, I just mentioned skills is, you know, that's brain development. So like, you, you don't, you know, you don't build skills in two weeks of school. So, uh, so we might have to be looking at the other lever pretty seriously. Um, Sharon, you want to chime in? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we've been talking about, you know, sort of two parts here, one of our founding teachers was like, you know, for the past 18 months, kids have done school without anybody intervening with how they're doing it. No comments or reminders or at bats to be like, 
hey, you know, let's put the phone away right now. Let's focus on this. Or, hey, I notice you're having another conversation, but we want to be listening to a classmate. Like for a year and a half, no one's had to listen to anybody, right? If you were at home. And so now you're coming back into an environment where you are getting a lot of those reminders. And that can be a lot when you haven't been getting to Hallie's point, that kind of practice. And you're doing it necessarily without, as Tia said, sort of some of the culture and some of the community. And so for us, as an example, you know, our middle school, we returned 300 students back to our middle school alone this fall. Those 100 sixth graders are brand new to us. They have no experience with the school. Half of the seventh grade was brand new to us because they chose to do remote learning as sixth graders. And half of the eighth graders also did remote learning and hadn't been in the building for over 18 months. So what you have is of 300 kids, you have two thirds of them that have literally no touch points with you, with each other, no relationship capital. They don't know the teachers. They don't know the routines. And so then you've got expectation and skill on top of what you don't have, which is relationships. And how do you how do you build that? And how do you how do you kind of center kind of belonging um because we're we're all missing it um and some kids like they're struggling to remember classmates names and teachers names a quarter of the way into the year and uh so helpful an observation right as if the gap between expectations and skills wasn't enough what you're describing is a culture vacuum um and a relational vacuum as well right and and, and uh, you know helping anybody with anything kids with their behavior developing skills it, it all requires it's the relationships all on the backs of relationships so such an important observation um jordan curious to hear your thoughts well um i can tell you what i don't think what's not I, well, let me restate that what's not a reason and that's teachers Teachers are not failing students right now. That's not a reason of, of why we're seeing behaviors because teachers were impacted personally and professionally over the past you know, year and a half, two years, just as much as students were. And when we're talking about all these impacts on students and children, um, you know, skills being impacted, stressors, that's happening to all, that happened to all of us. And educators as well who learned in short order how to try and teach remotely and who sometimes were teaching remotely while also teaching in person and um, trying to get flexible. And was the system perfect? No. And, and everyone was doing the best they could in those moments. And I think it's important for us, you know, we have that philosophy of, of kids do well if they can, and it's actually people do well if they can, and educators have been doing the best that they can. And what my thought is that what happens is we're in this system where, okay, now that things are back to normal, this is what should be happening. And that system has not accounted for the fact that we all just have, have been and are still living in a, a pandemic, a global pandemic. Um, and again, that's not excusing anything. It's just trying to help explain what's going on. And so teachers, and again, I'm not, I don't wanna speak for anyone, but just from some of the, the work that I've done with people, you know, what they're talking about is the expectations on the teachers are still the same. You're gonna have statewide expectations. You have all these things you're supposed to be getting students to and, and teachers feel that pressure. And so uh, Shalia, I don't wanna speak as, as someone who's in, you know, actually doing the educating there. I'm not trying to speak for you, so correct me if I'm saying anything wrong here, but like that pressure is still there and you expect yourself to be able to achieve that knowing that your students are impacted and knowing that 15 months ago, we were just trying to connect with our students. Academics were out the window. We're just trying to make sure that we're, we're touching bases. And now all of this is, we're, we're, we're back to normal. And um, yet, as everyone else has said already, we know that people are not normal right now when it comes to our ability to manage stresses in appropriate ways. And uh, Jordan, a couple of things just to highlight of what you're saying here. You know, um, blame is not going to get us anywhere. Um, and everybody's trying to sort of handle this the best they possibly can. And our educators the last couple of years, it's just heroic what they have done. Um, the, the uh, you know, um, 
there, there's sort of so many important things about um, <laughs> what you're saying that I want to get back to another piece too. But Tia, it looked like you were eager to, to jump in. So jump in and I'll come back at the end there too. Well, I just loved um, what everyone is saying. And my Think Kids family knows I'm a person that is always assessing need, right? And so speaking to Jordan's point, we're, we're talking about teachers and students, right? Sometimes we forget that we are all in it together, right? And so um, to hate to bring it up again, but Maslow's hierarchy of needs is something that I'm always assessing. Is the psychological needs being met? Does everybody in this, in this place feel safe? Do they feel loved? Do they feel esteemed? Do they feel belonging? And I think if those are not addressed, um, just in general, how can we even set an expectation? And then how can we build up the skills? So the need, the, the professional practice of acknowledging need for everyone in this space is very, very important. Um, and something that as an, an educator and a school leader, it, I'm, I'm constantly in reflection about, constantly in reflection about. Thank you, Jean. I just want to respond to something in the chat here that um, I, I, I want to clarify. I don't. I, I didn't hear uh, Jordan your uh, your comments suggesting that uh, um, teachers. There's nothing teachers can do to help address the problem. Or there, um, that, that I didn't hear that. What I heard from you is um, teachers have been working overtime, and not only, by the way, as you said, to be teaching like remotely in person, while by the way taking care of their own children and helping their own children learn remotely. Like it's just sort of heroic efforts, but absolutely uh, teachers, school leaders, uh, parents, everybody needs to be a, a part of the solution here. Um, so, and, and the other thing I want to get back to that you mentioned too, Jordan, is this pressure upon our educators. And Sharon, I know you and I talked about this. One of the ironic things that happens is the more that people feel pressure to uh, meet expectations that are out of, out of reach, the more we push students to reach them. And we try to sort of uh, push development along faster than it is, is able to go. And that always causes problems. You cannot speed natural human development faster than it's, it can ordinarily pace itself. And so your job is sort of to get kids back on what we call the, uh, the developmental wave. But if you try to push development too fast, whoa, does that always backfire? Um, we've got the second half of this hour together, having set the stage, understood what's going on. Uh, a lot of, I think, really important insights as to what's causing what's going on. Um, all right, folks. <laughs> Um, what do we do here? Solutions, approaches, mindsets. Um, what can we do to help here? Um, and this is going to be all hands on deck, folks. Um, so let me see where I, I'm going to go completely out of order here. Um, so, you know, get ready. Uh, just going to call on you. Okay. Uh, Sharon, how about you? W what can we do? <laughs> Um, like well, I can tell you some of the things that we're trying, um, cause I think one of the things that we can do is, is try then talk with students, with teachers, with families, see if what we're trying is working and then adjust and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Um, so I think at our school, one of the things we're trying right now is we've just changed up our daily schedule, right? We realized that some of these transition points were really challenging. So we tried to rebuild our time in the day um, to create more regulation um, for students. Um, we have also, like I'm sure many here, expanded our social work teams um, and have more counselors on campus uh, working with individuals and in small groups. Um, one of the things that we did is we brought a new social emotional um, learning curriculum to school and our students are doing um, a circle model every week um, and in circle students get to share something about themselves right so that they are more seen and more whole to their classmates and to their teachers and so I think more that we can do for kids to feel that they can bring their whole selves to school and build connections um, with with others, I think, really helps. Um, and then I think we have to do a lot more that at least at the middle school and high school level, probably a lot of what we thought was just understood about how to be a student in a classroom, how to be a member of a community needs to be explicitly taught and discussed 
over and over and over again. And I think Stuart, you and I talked about like our sophomores, their last uninterrupted year of school was seventh grade. And like what you're doing in seventh grade as a student versus what's being asked of you in 10th grade is so different. So I think we have to, we have to keep doing more of that. Um, and I think we just have to keep reflecting, right? Like when stuff happens, like reminding people of like, how do we want to be in community? How do we want to talk with one another, right? And then continue to reflect and restore and reflect and restore. Um, I don't think it's like we can do anything that you can just like buy off the shelf and implement, right? right? It's like a bunch of small things all rooted in the the deepening of personal relationships and 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 students feeling and teachers feeling um, emotionally and physically safe to then be able to do the work to grow. And so I think all these moves, we kind of hope like, okay, it's like a potpourri of moves, right? right. <laughs> um, that will help us. Can you, can you say one more thing though about, you know, when you and I talked, mm -hmm. um, uh, you had made that same observation about kids having a hard time shifting gears. You know, it was almost mm -hmm. like middle schoolers and high schoolers mm -hmm. looked like the kids that Shalia teaches, mm -hmm. where you know they all stink at shifting gears mm -hmm. from one thing to the next. And that's why you have like bells and whistles and chimes and songs and claps and things to move them along. And all, you know, I think, look, in the pandemic, there were no shifts, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. You had some novel ideas about how to adjust, I think, some make some environmental yeah. adjust, adjustments so that that wasn't such a challenge. Yeah, we 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 um we spent like three months last spring, right, with team and teachers building this year's schedule. Right. And like this whole process and and in it, it was like what we had was like you do some class, then you break that up and you do like advisory, then you go back to some class, then you go to lunch then class, then tutoring, then class. And even as I'm saying it to y'all now, all those shifts are really hard because what you're asking students to do is different in class from advisory, from tutoring, from lunch and teachers. So the, the switching costs, the like time, um, really we were really struggling to regulate in those spaces. So what we did is we kind of took a bunch of those things and moved them to the start of the day so that we start the day in, you know, advisory or in tutoring or in smaller spaces where kids are known and seen. And then we try to move into more consistent rhythm with our classes. And, and that's what we're trying right now. Um, and the other thing we tried to do is kind of um, allow teachers to um, try to be in classroom spaces more consistently so that kids are coming and moving to them versus teachers moving to students. And so the idea is that if, if teachers can kind of have a home base and have a place where they feel, you know, regulated and ready, and then they can kind of use that. And so we're trying a couple of those things to help both kids and teachers. Well, and I, I love the flexible, creative thinking. I think that suggestion uh, speaks right to something that's been raised in the chat, which is sort of how do you help the educators here and help the educators to stay grounded and regulated because a dysregulated educator is never going to regulate a dysregulated um, student. So, um, I, you know, I think really important information and gets right to this issue of skills because that what you were talking about is, uh, you know, what as a clinical psychologist, we call uh, the skill uh, is called shifting cognitive set, moving from one task or activity to another and shifting your arousal level from because different tasks and activities require different things from our, our bodies and, uh, and our minds. Uh, so thank you, Sharon. Shalia, I'm interested, uh, you know, I, I like uh, contrasting things here because we go right from high school and middle school right down to the little ones here. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, solution oriented, I think that we just need to acknowledge that COVID has never happened. So after COVID has never happened. So we were all experts in something, whether it's teaching, whether it's leading, whether it's being a social worker or a counselor, but we've never done it after COVID, which means that it needs all of us. Like everyone has to take their space and their piece of expertise, and we need to bring it together to solve and to serve for our students and our families, which are primary, they're the most important. So I feel like if we all humble ourselves and say, we've never done this before. There are things that I've been used to doing for years that 
had to change. Like you had to change your approach. You had to change how you reach out to families, how you contact them, whether it's texting, whether it's phone calls, like you have to kind of reevaluate everything and make it for now. You can't do what you used to do, but we also have to acknowledge that what we did before doesn't exactly work so that we need each other. We need everybody and their expertise to come together and sit and to work and to serve our students and our families because we can't do it the way that we did it before. The traumas are different, the needs are different and we kind of have to come in from that place or we're not gonna be successful. If everyone thinks that they know everything and that they're doing it perfectly, then we're gonna miss the mark and we're not gonna meet the needs of our students and their families. So, so wise, I mean, look, we're making this up as we go along, right? We have no playbook for this, which is one of the reasons we wanted to put this group together and just sort of share ideas and experiences. And you're pointing to something that one of the questions that was raised, which is, um, you know, any ideas about successful uh, parent engagement strategies uh, in this new reality? And what I think I hear you saying, Shalia, is um, that you got to reach out a lot more personally directly and in ways that honestly pre-pandemic people may have not even felt was like you know uh, appropriate or part of their job well guess what uh it's essential at this point and i'd love if people could in, in the rest of the comments keep an eye on that um and uh before i uh ask um let's see i'll uh, ask jordan to chime in in a second here i, I do want to address uh, pam's question about the use of punitive exclusionary discipline you know what, before the pandemic, we here at Think Kids, most of our work was trying to help people see that punitive school discipline, and by the way, most school discipline is punitive traditionally, that it has incredibly detrimental effects on all students uh, because it flows from outdated ideas about what causes challenging behavior. And it also has disproportionate impacts, uh, particularly on kids of color, students of color, and students with trauma histories. And guess what, fast forward to today, and the vast majority of kids in our schools have some sort of a trauma history now. So it is time to retire punitive exclusionary disciplinary practices. And by the way, it just makes things worse. I mean, one of our biggest challenges is, is getting kids into school and keeping them engaged. How could we possibly think of interventions that take kids away from or out of school? They're outdated, they're ineffective, they lead to poor outcomes. And if not now, when are we gonna get rid of these things? Um, all right, Jordan. Follow up on that. All right. So, um, I mean, I, I agree with some of the stuff that's been said is that we don't know, like if we're not going to try and sell that we have answers. Um, I like what Sharon said is that we have things that we're trying. We have things that we're trying and we're seeing how that's going. And um, like Shalia said, we it needs to be not just a group of panelists figuring this out. It is people in their communities with parents, with anyone who's involved in the lives of students you know, being at the table, like trying to figure this out, because it's not going to be a solution that we apply to someone, it's going to be a solution we generate with people. Um, the other thing that I want to clarify, I was just kind of looking over some of the some of the questions is when we talk about behavior, we're not doing so in a judgmental way. When we talk about students coming with behaviors, we're saying those behaviors are happening because they are being presented with expectations that they do not have the skills to meet. And that doesn't excuse it, it just explains and so when we say that there are some students who, have, who are dysregulation, we are saying that is because of the trauma that they've experienced over the past year and a half. That is because of the, the demand and all of the context right now of what we are living in, as Julia said, like these after COVID times, like where we're trying to navigate that. Like the behaviors that we see is not a place, when we, when we acknowledge that, that's not from a place of judgment, it's from a place of understanding that what that's telling us is that there are a lot of demands and expectations that we are referring to as like normal school expectations that because of where students are at right now, they are not able to meet them. And that's not because they don't want to, it's because they've been impacted. The skill development has been impacted. And that is why, you know, uh, Stuart was saying punitive discipline, which just teaches people, hey, that was the right or wrong thing to do. That's not what students need to know. They need to practice it how to do that again. And so when you have a second grader who has never had schooling before because it was all remote, so they've never been in school around 30 other students in a classroom having to navigate, you know, going to a cafeteria, all of that, that's brand new. The students who are struggling, it's not because they're 
difficult or, or willful or whatever. It's because that's new and they have not had opportunities to practice those skills yet. And so behavior and skill is related. And I just want to clarify that when we are, or we are all talking about behaviors, it is not coming from a place of judgment. It's not coming from a place of like othering students or anything like that it is us understanding that the demands that we have currently are outstripping a lot of the skills of those students in our schools. And that's not parents' fault. That's not the student's fault. That's not the teacher's fault. That is just the way it is right now. And so what we're trying to do is knowing that that's happening, what do we do about that? And so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Thank you for clarifying that, Jordan. I wanted to make sure that we did that as well. Really appreciate it. All right, Tia, thoughts? Um, so behavior and skill, um, something that I wanna honor is that the people that are at this table or anybody that's on this uh, webinar right now, all the people that are listening, we are the behavior and skill. We're practicing the behavior of supporting, supporting kids and supporting schools. So in thinking about when school was um, about to reopen, um, it took really making everyone a fearless leader. That was the students, the teachers, the admin, uh, the community that supports us, the places where we get resources from and putting us all to the table. And me as a principal, I, instead of having my principal hat, I need to have my facilitator hat, a facilitator of, of, of this knowledge that everybody's bringing so we can devise a plan to get to the next space. Um, and so some of those things that were on our plan, the first thing was when we came back into school, we had two weeks of no content. So no ELA, no math, no science, no history. It was all just social emotional learning and culture building. So rebranding our students to being, as Jordan spoke about, what do you do with a student that has never been in school or just was, you know, so shut down from school in my case, you know, middle school. Um, living behind a computer. How do you, how do you reprogram that or, or change that narrative for them? Um, and forcing content down their throat was not the way at the beginning. Um, now we can see the turnaround in it because now they feel like I can grasp the content because I had time just to be for a second and to learn my teachers and to learn the people sitting to the right or, right or left of me and um, building those safety measures within the classroom. Um, you're in COVID, you're influenced by the news, you're seeing all you know tragedies, people dying. Um, things that's happening in hospitals. How does this the student and the teacher feel safe in the classroom? The sanitation stations, is there contact tracing? Is there assigned seats? Do they know that um, I'm sitting next to the same person day to day? So I know I'm gonna be safe in this space right now so that I can learn and I can get my skill. Um, and that goes for the teacher you know, as well. Do they feel comfortable in a, in a size classroom that they're in? Um, something that we implemented was a morning advisory is still all social emotional learning every day, Monday through Friday. And then a deeper dive of that every second and fourth Friday um, through our platform, through our, our school's mission is building that, that need. So it's built into our curriculum um, for all teachers. Positive incentives was something that was big for us. We have a system called bonus bucks. And so bonus bucks, we believe as, as you have said, Stuart, the punitive behavior across the board, you know, suspension. We want students to be with us. How are they going to get what they need? How are they going to build the skill? How are they going to build the behaviors if they're not next to us day to day? Um, and so if a student per chance takes away from community, how are they giving back to community? And that's the dialogue. Are we talking to them? Do they understand what happened? Um, do we understand what happened with them? So taking collaborative problem solving, taking that, those, those steps um, and addressing the issues in that way. Um, so the bonus buck system, um, we, we reward them for everything. And some people think it's so cliche, you know, build, build them up. You don't have to, you know, you have to reward them and you reward the parents with the communication and the phone calls and letting them know your child did amazing today. You know, they did this, this and that um, and giving parents opportunity to come and observe us as teachers and school leaders and how, how do they do that? Um, opening those, building those lines of parent communication is, is key. Um, parents need their bonus bucks too, you know, and making them feel like they are a part of this, this total vision of this rebuilding um, of schools. Uh, we also changed the narrative of Chromebooks. Chromebooks were a villain for a while. Um, I read in the comments, yes, sometimes they were not working, the internet, whatever. We went to college, I went to college, I use my laptop for everything. When I was <laughs> doing my research, it was laptop on the grind. So how are students interpreting their computer, bring a tool of college access or, or being 
greater as they going along in this um, trajectory, their educational journey. So we changed our narrative. So we're a college preparatory middle school. We know high school is there, but we are college preparatory middle school because in college, we have to hold our, our Chromebooks and our laptops and we have to go day to day and we're always using them. So we switched up a couple of our um, narrations for students and now they feel so much pride in um, the balance between the Chromebook and live teaching and supporting teachers within that, giving them the technology within their classrooms to be able to maintain it so it's not a, a drastic shift um, for students going from virtual learning into in-school learning. Um, just making sure that everybody, every stakeholder has a place in, in their being welcome to the table to talk. Yeah, and it sounds like, Tia, one of the things that, the great, great list of suggestions, one of the, the commonalities that runs between them is, um, trying to make sure everybody has a seat at the table and ownership and authorship in how we're going to address this because it's not going to come from school leaders or just from teachers or parents um, or, or even just the kids. It's going to have to be a collective effort here. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Hallie, want to give you a chance to chime in here as well. And then uh, I'll just warn my panelists here. Well, we're going to uh, finish up by asking uh, you each for a, a parting suggestion um, for the group as well. Uh, and by the way, we're, we're going to try to address some of the, the comments that have come in and those parting suggestions as well. Allie. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I just building on, I think what, what Tia was saying at the beginning of building that culture and that community in the school, school buildings is so vitally important. And one of the kind of foundational components of collaborative problem solving that is so um, profound for building that connection and that relationship is empathy. And this is kind of my parting thought and something we can implement that when we provide those opportunities and make the time and say that it's important to hear everyone's voice and seek to understand where our students are coming from, where our teachers are coming from, where our administrators are coming from, where our specialists are coming from in terms of their perspective of how what their experience is like in the day to day or how they're experiencing, you know, um, different situations that are coming up in the classroom or they're teaching when we can kind of work in and build that culture and make sure there's time to have those opportunities for that voice to be heard and that voice to be shared and have that importance of that, meaning that we 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 find creative ways to build the time to do that within the classroom setting and within um, discussions and structures that we have, that maybe we find time to do that in staff meetings or other professional development type things so that we build that um, for our, that's that, that support for our staff and for our teachers, as well as our families that we're interfacing and connecting with. Because I do think there was a question in the chat window um, about how to engage families. And oftentimes what I have found in my experience of working in school settings is that there's a lot of shame that parents feel when their child has challenging behaviors, right? Because typically the history is that they've been blamed or have felt blame for those challenging behaviors. And that can put a divide between the relationships that are built between home and school. And so when we can partner with um, parents, hear their perspective and really think about what are some of the things that we see their child struggling with rather than just talking about the challenging behaviors and focus on the skills that can be trained and built, that's where we can kind of start to build some of those collaborative relationships um, in that. And so I just think that, that we know that empathy is important and we sometimes have to be more intentional about how we build that into the structures of our day so that we are um, practicing that thing that we know is so important. Very well said, Hallie. All right, so um, I'm gonna go around one more time and just ask people to give one parting suggestion as succinctly as possible. Um, and Shalia, I'm gonna uh, start with you if you don't mind. Sure, um, I would say connection and care. Um, connection as in, as educators, like stay connected with your families and their students. That means um, consistent text messages, um, phone calls, really being super connected. Like when we went into COVID, we were so connected with our classroom and our community that the adjustment became the computers and technology because we had already built those relationships that were really um, profound during COVID. Um, and care is the care of your students and their families as well as yourself. 
Um, find a circle if you are an educator um, that you can talk to, whatever it takes, getting massages, getting your hair done, whatever, it, you know, whatever that is, caring for yourself and caring for your students. My classroom is a home community. We, it's COVID, but we give hugs. It's COVID. It's okay if parents say, I forgot to pack a snack today. Is there an extra snack or can you give my child X, Y, and Z? It's really like connection and care is definitely um, where it's at. And all the way through, through June, past June, um, and all the ways. Great message, Shalia, thank you. Sharon. Um, I was just gonna say that to, to the point made earlier, like we've never been in this position before and it's gonna take like new problems, new solutions, right? And I think that the, the way for us to really move forward where we're seeing light is like our upperclassmen are leading the way and leading the messaging and having the conversations with students in our building. And I think that's so powerful, right? Like centering the people most proximate to the problem as you work to build solutions. Um, and we have been doing something over the past couple of years that we call empathy interviews, where we interview one-to-one -one someone for an hour um, to try to understand how our students feeling, how our families feeling, how our teachers feeling. And I think we need to do more rounds of that as we make our way through right now. And so, um, because it's, it's not just like, oh, you can take one survey and no, it's like, you gotta keep working and listening and then using what you're hearing to design what's gonna come next because we don't even yet know the next need. And so I think it, it's listening, deeply listening um, and, and being willing to try something different um, if that's what the community says it needs um, and being really open to the fact that what works in one community might not work in the next, but it is, it is the community coming together um, to figure out next steps. Um, and I just think that there is so many brilliant people in each of our communities that like us having more time together to do the work together will be what's necessary to build this skill. Thank you, Sharon. I love the message of listening. You know, there's in moments like this where things are so dire, there's such um, a, a sort of pressure to, to do and to act. And what we often forget to do is to listen, first and foremost, uh, which, by the way, itself is regulating. When there's a lot of comments about how do we regulate educators, how do we regulate kids? Listening, empathy is the, the most potent human regulator we have at the end of the day. Uh, Jordan. So um, I was looking at one of the one of the questions just about what about, you know, we're talking about students in general, what about students with additional needs like students on the autism spectrum, et cetera. Um, and so I was trying to think of something to kind of capture all of that. And really it comes down to um, being aware of our expectations for students. And so this is specifically for educators in, in schools, like being aware of the expectations. And a lot of expectations that we just assumed students were able to meet, I think we, we have to kind of take that away and we have to look at really, are these expectations reasonable considering everything that we've discussed? And then if not, what are we able to do about some of them? Knowing that there are forces above us that are like, hey, you have to do certain things, but just looking at those expectations. So a step that we can take, look at your expectations, are any of them things that were like, what it would happen if we just put pause on that for a while and focused on some other things would that decrease the stress in the classroom? Would that decrease the stress for some of the individuals and kind of go from there? Thank you. All right, uh, quickly here. Let me see if I can give you each a minute tops. Sorry about that. Uh, Tia, you're up. Uh, just very quickly, giving students their voice back, empowering them to speak, and they will tell you what they need. They will tell you how to maneuver in the classroom with them, um, sometimes adults, myself included as a school leader have made, you know, decisions for, for students. And we need to allow them their seat at the table and honor that seat and uh, give them their voice, give them their power back and make it so they can eventually lead us. Beautifully said. Thank you, Tia. All right, Hallie. It's hard to follow that, Tia. That was beautiful. Um, I would say I, you know, I saw kind of a comment in the chat window about, you know, educator stress tolerance and um, feeling that amount of stress. 
And one of the things that we have in our model is something called a plan C. And that means um, perhaps suspending an expectation of ourselves for a period of time. And that's actually really hard for us to do for ourselves um, if we are in the position of caring for others and, and um, giving to others. And I have found it being profoundly powerful in coaching educators in school settings to say, what is something that you can take off your plate, right? And it's okay. It doesn't mean that expectation is not important to you. It just means we need to reduce some stress for you right now. And what can we do to do that? And that's an important thing that we often, I think as adults have a hard time doing for ourselves to provide some self-compassion and some care for ourselves. All right, great advice. Um, and there's a theme here of sort of reducing some demands and expectations on our educators. And I'm gonna finish with my thought being, I think we need to dramatically decrease the expectations upon our students. I think that the expectations remain largely what they looked like pre-COVID, uh, but kids haven't developed the skills. And I know the pushback when I suggest this is that we have statewide mandated testing. We've got things that we have to adhere to. And my feeling is, you know what? If you had said two years ago, we're gonna do a whole year of school online without going into a school building entirely on our computers, everybody would have said, no way could we possibly do that. It is too big of a shift. It's too big of a pivot. We can't do it. And we did it. It was a tremendous efforts, but people did it. So we can make massive changes when it's absolutely needed. My feeling is it is absolutely needed for us to make massive changes in the expectations um, upon students and educators alike right now, because we're just setting everybody up for tremendous um, frustration. I'm not suggesting it's easy, but nothing that uh, ultimately makes a huge difference uh, is particularly easy. So uh, we're right up at five o'clock Eastern time here. I wanna thank my fellow uh, panelists for joining us here, for um, giving us their time, for sharing their insights, their experiences, their expertise. I really hope it was helpful for those of you um, out there. In just a moment, uh, when this webinar closes, we're, we're gonna ask you to please keep your browser open just for a short survey. We'd love your feedback on how we can help better uh, serve educators, parents, families alike. Um, so we encourage you to share your feedback as well as suggestions for future webinars because I saw some of that coming in as well. Um, and you'll get a follow-up email of anyone who registered for this with a link to the recording if you want to uh, play this for other folks or uh, take a little more time to hear some of these great suggestions um, from my colleagues. And we'll also share with you uh, some resources, including upcoming trainings that we have in our collaborative problem-solving approach, which we're very biased, of course, uh, but we feel is uh, incredibly well suited, sadly, to the times that we're in um, right now. I think every one of us could use a little bit more empathy, understanding, and collaborative problem solving um, in their lives. Thank you all for joining us, educators out there. Thank you for all you're doing for our kids, for our families. It's uh, heroic. Um, please uh, hang in there, and we really hope this helps. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye now. Thank you.